This is delivered by Dr. Um, Ashraf Zahabi. Dr. Ashraf Zahabi is a dear friend of mine and um, everybody uh, probably at this uh, point knows Ashraf. Ashraf is the president of the Emirate Thoracic uh, Society. Uh, he, is, he works inside military hospital. He's the head of respiratory division uh, there. Um, and he's um, graduated from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland in 1997 and did his training in internal medicine and respirology for six years at the University of Toronto in Canada between um, 2006 to, um, or between 2000 and 2006, where he um, board certified in both specialty uh, in Canada and USA. Since arrival to the UAE, uh, he managed to develop the state-of-the-art uh, patient services in respiratory medicine uh, in um, Zayed Military Hospital in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and the first endoscopy center performing in the Indu bronchial ultrasound guided biopsy procedures in the AOE. In 2007, he was appointed as a clinical assistant professor in internal medicine at the Faculty of Medicine um, and Healthcare at the UAE University. Uh, Ashraf uh, won many distinctions um, um, and awards, such as the prestigious Mori Morihead uh, Award in 2001 from the University of Toronto during his residency program. In two, um, uh, 2013, he won the Abu Dhabi Medical Distinction Award in Clinical Performance launched by the Health Authority in Abu Dhabi. It's great to have you here, Ashraf, and thank you for coming. I know you're very busy and I really appreciate your um, thank presence. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome again. This is an um, industrial symposium uh, for Novartis. You want me to take off my mask? Okay. For the picture or for the whole thing? Thank you. Okay. So if you would allow me, I'd like to put it back. Thank you. Um, I've been asked to uh, speak about Umalizumab. And uh, alhamdulillah, I've always had a good relationship with our partners in the pharmaceutical that they allow me to speak about the disease in general which I think might be a superficial talk for most of you, uh, but hopefully if our colleagues are joining us virtually, they would uh, maybe um, benefit from some of the points that we see on a daily basis. I'd like to talk to you today about a patient-centric approach, umalizumab, real-world evidence in severe asthma and comorbidities. What's our experience? Umalizumab remains to be one of the oldest friends that we use and continue to use in patients who have severe asthma. And I'll discuss with that with you. These are my disclosures. My objective today is to really differentiate with you between uncontrolled asthma, severe asthma. Comorbidities of asthma, Dr. Karam has already outlined how important this is. And when it comes to severe asthmatics, what is it that we take into consideration before we choose which agent to use. Our real world evidence of anti-IgE in severe asthma and other comorbidities such as nasal polyposis, for example. And I will share with you the latest data. I'll start with a case, 26 year old local national boy who is a medwakh smoker, so he's not an electronic cigarette. He presented to the clinic with bronchial asthma history, eczema, nasal polyp removal, and he did report significant allergy to non-steroidal. Now you'll say, okay, so he has that. I have to say, reaching to this point in the history reminds you that you're, hyster you're a clinician and you really need to ask about things. Do you think a patient will volunteer to tell you he has non-steroidal problem, allergy, uh, intolerance, if you don't really make it a systematic and consistently asking patients and doing the right homework when somebody present with uncontrolled asthma. He has dyspnea on exertion, frequent rescue medication need, recurrent night symptoms, ACT questionnaire, nine. You know, ACT above 20 is reassuring. Anything below that is alarming. He visited the emergency department. So that's a red flag already. Works in oil field, makes things worse and more interesting. No animals but feels symptoms worsen if he gets close to them. He felt initially better when his pulmonologist put him on an ICS lab, 
but then things started to get out of control. Saturation was normal. Eczema is very apparent in his flexor creases, and he had nose obstruction, nasal obstruction. And when I listened to him that day, he had no wheeze. His xenophil count was 130. His IgE, 812. The allergy panel is positive, and it was significantly increased with the following, and his exhaled nitric oxide is 57. How do you approach this patient? We did a little bit more of the bread and butter for a doctor, so we basically asked him to do a peak flow meter readings, and this guy was really consistent, and you can see that his peak expiratory flow in the morning was consistently lower than his evening numbers. He had no significant bronchiectasis or abnormality on his chest X-ray, and his PFT actually at his baseline was normal. So we labeled him as uncontrolled asthma. He has aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. We gave him the ICS LABA, the Montelukast antilicotriene, and we told him, as per the recent GINA guideline, every time you take a rescue medication, please take a puff of inhaled corticosteroids with it. So asthma is really a group of diseases and different patterns. And 20 to 30% of our kids, they have transient asthma at age three and above. But then there is this other black box for the older patients when they develop asthma as an adult. And we don't know how patients behave. In one of the studies that followed young people who developed asthma for 25 years, the article that was published in New England General Medicine suggested that 60 and above percent of asthmatics can grow out of their asthma. And we always enjoy these dark circles. And maybe Bassam with his omics and artificial intelligence will try and separate these circles. Is it type two inflammation asthma? Is it non-type two inflammation asthma? Is it the comorbid one that I should really focus on? Is it the exhaled nitric oxide that's the main driver for this inflammation? Atopy, no atopy. What defines severe asthma in an individual? What is type two high inflammation? Which biomarker do we use? And what does each one signify? Role of biologic and which kind of asthma? So severe asthma, as you may all know, severe asthma is an asthma that requires treatment with high dose two controllers to keep them controlled or they remain uncontrolled uh, despite this treatment, or if you need to give them systemic steroids despite uh, this, they remain uncontrolled. Why do we care about severe asthma? Because it has been associated with asthma mortality, ER visits and hospitalization, quality of life for patients and for their family is inversely proportional to the number of days they spend out of school because of their asthma. Number of weeks they have uncontrolled asthma. Quality of life actually reach a point that if you ask a mother with an asthmatic child, she'll tell you among the three pro big problems in my life is my child with asthma, especially if they are uncontrolled. So there, there's definitely family disruption. And not talking about side effects of these medications. However, if you look at 100 asthmatics who have difficult asthma, 88% of them will have difficult to treat asthma because they are not using the inhaler, they are non-compliant, they have comorbid that Dr. Karam mentioned and not being taken care of. Only 12% will be your severe asthmatic. And if we look in our hospital, for example, Zaid Military Hospital, we have out of a small pool of 409 asthmatics, we're not supposed to have 3,500 like Mohammed Abu Zakouk in Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi and Hamad Al Hamli because we're military. So our pool is smaller. 400 patients with asthma. Among those, we have 55 severe asthmatic. That translates into 13%. 43% of those, so almost half, are on biologics. And our biggest group is on umalizumab, we know it better, we had it first, and we feel safer using it for most of our asthmatics. 
What does Muhammad Abu Zakuk say about that? We gathered the data from Muhammad Abu Zakuk, and he asked me, Ashraf, do you have a pool? I gave him my 50 asthmatics. Bassam gave him 100 or 150, and he published a beautiful article last uh, year, 2021. And Muhammad Abu Zakuk, remember my number of 13.4, 11.6. Roughly of the Cleveland Clinic asthmatics, not all our pool, his pool uh, had severe asthma. So 350 out of 3,500, roughly 10 to 11 percent. So it seems like this is the severe asthma fraction in UAE. And when you ask uh, Hamad Abu Zakouk, when we pooled the Zaid Military Hospital with Cleveland Clinic and Dubai, 23.8 percent of those were on biologics, as opposed to 43 in my pool. Is it because uh, my severe asthmatics are really stratified and they're really severe that I have higher fraction of them on biologics? If I compare my data with the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi data, I get the Pyoprid study, 33% of those who are believed to have severe asthma require biologics. So I want you to remember these numbers, 33, 23, 43 something to do with the three. But Sam Mahboub did a similar study in the Snapchat program, and he noticed among his data, and I don't know, this is in the Gulf, so 38.2 of our pool, sorry, the mouse is not showing here, so 38.2 have uncontrolled asthma, comorbid, like Dr. Karam at Zaid Military Hospital, 43% have obesity, high BMI, nasal polyp, allergic rhinitis remains a significant comorbidity. And this co, uh, that actually goes along with the right-hand side here, another international study of what common comorbids allergic um, asthmatics have. So the second uh, part of my talk is on type two inflammation. I will not spend more time uh, detailing this because my previous speakers did the homework for me, but you all know about type two inflammation being characterized by two things, cytokines. And people now are talking about the JAK, type two inflammation. And, but don't forget that atopy remains a big problem. And for umalizumab, and this is the uh, main part of the second half of my talk, is to talk about umalizumab and where does it fit in the management of severe asthmatics. Umalizumab is being thought to be a good and ideal choice for asthmatics if they have atopy. And this is defined by um, exhaled nitric oxide of more than 20, isonophilic count more than 260, provided that you, pro you prove that this patient have allergic driven symptoms and you tested those patients. It seems like patients who have childhood onset asthma are a better candidate for uh, this medication if they develop severe uncontrolled asthma. Allergic trigger, non-allergic trigger. Innate immune system, which is immediate, or adaptive immune symptoms. What I'm trying to say here, where does the umalizumab play a role? And I will ask you to focus on the left-hand side here of the graph. Allergen comes to the naive cell. And this cell is so, I call it naive, but I don't mean naive medical. I call it naive in our terms. It's naive because why do you carry on the burden of presenting an allergen to the type two helper cell, uh, T helper cell? This T helper cell becomes very irritated if they get presented to an allergen. They produce cytokines like IL-13 and IL-4 and this leads to switching of the beta lymphocytes, switching of, Ig, uh, of the uh, beta lymphocytes to produce IgE. IgE goes to mast cell. And the closest thing that I like to describe mast cells are the angry smurf. It's like angry smurf. They're sitting pump. They have all sorts of bad things inside them. Once IgE uh, uh, attack them, they release all the cytokine. And this is where the beauty of anti-IgE comes into play. We also you know about the interleukin-5 and eosinophilic activation and eosinophil role in uncontrolled severe asthma. 
Why do we say uh, xenophil are important? Xenophils, when they are high in asthmatics, and by high in, a diff in this particular study, a UK study, where they chose the cutoff of 400. So if you're asthmatic, is uncontrolled, there is an effect, is more than 400. This means they are at higher risk on the right side of severe exacerbation, high risk of acute respiratory events, and their risk and their asthma control is less likely to happen as compared to those who don't have an isenophilia and uncontrolled asthma. Study actually assessed the 25 year mortality in 1,000 patients who had asthma. And a xenophil count on its own of more than 450 was associated in asthmatics with higher mortality. An uncontrolled asthmatic who gets hospitalized is the group that is at higher risk of mort or dying. Lower lung function is at higher risk of dying. And the older an asthmatic, the higher risk they have from death. Thank God, in a study that we just finished, a trend of asthma mortality in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, out of all death from respiratory diseases in Abu Dhabi, asthma was less than 6% of death in any respiratory disease um, uh, causing mortality in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. And this applies to 2015, 16, 17, and 18. When we diagnose severe eosinophilic asthma, you probably heard about major criteria, minor criteria, severe asthma, blood xenophilia, their big thing, frequent exacerbation, two or more, and dependence on steroids. These are the major criteria. It seems that late onset asthma is more common in severe asthmatics with xenophilic, uh, xenophilic asthma, more than atopic asthma. However, we see the interchange between the two. How do I decide, and this is the last part of the talk, how do I decide which biologic to use? If it's an adult asthma versus a childhood asthma. Childhood will make me think of atopy. Umalizumab will be higher on my choice, especially if I document atopy. Nasal polyp, there are a couple of biologics um, licensed now for this, such as umalizumab and dupilumab, exacerbation frequency. This is registry from Zaid Military Hospital for my severe asthmatics. Our mean is in field count is 330. The IgE mean is 570. Pheno mean is 37. And the atopy affects about 20% of my asthmatics. And I'll tell you why that is. And we monitor those patients when they come to our clinic by assessing their symptoms, their exacerbations, their quality of life, side effects from the medication, and how satisfied the patient is. I have to say, all biologics work. And they, they sound to work in about 50% of the time. And by work, I mean reducing exacerbation, improving lung function, improving symptoms, and better quality of life. And umalizumab studies have results ranging from 50 to 70%. I, Ashraf, usually look beside the patient's history and atopy. I look at their xenophil count to make sure that they fulfill the criteria. The studies showed me that if there is an xenophil count of more than 260 and exhaled nitric oxide of more than 20, this is a good candidate for my umalizumab uh, patients, umalizumab responsive patients. I told you that in my patient pool, the atopy was only 20% among severe asthmatics. However, this study shows you that up to 60 to 80% of um, proportion of patients with severe asthma have atopy. This is more in children. The older the, the severe asthmatics are, the less prevalence of atopy. And in that, among patients with adult onset asthma, those with severe asthma are less likely to be atopic, 34% as opposed to 52% in younger. So 34 in adults, my patient population was 20%. Um, and the last um, thing I wanted to discuss with you is what umal umalizumab actually does. Umalizumab prevents IgE binding to dendritic cells, those kind cells who sometimes are doing, I think, more harm by presenting those antigen cells. So umalizumab 
binds to the IgE as an anti-IgE and prevents them from doing that. This um, uh, prevents IgE from binding from mast cells, the angry smear cells, if you would allow me to call them. And this leads to um, stopping the early phase response, the late phase response, the edema, the mucus, pro uh, the mucus production, the bronchospasm, and the eosinophilic migration. Studies have shown that IgE antibody decreases eosinophil in patients' peripheral blood, in patients' sputum, as this study has shown. Studies from bronchial biopsy have shown that umalizumab reduces eosinophil in bronchial tissue. And this has led to the, what we know about umalizumab reducing annual exacerbation in both adults and children. Actually, you probably all know that umalizumab is one of the safest biologics that we've known because we've known them so long. We can use them for children above 12 years of age for asthma, above six years of age for uh, nasal uh, polyp issues, and the risk exacerbation risk is reduced by 50 to 60 percent. And this is across all groups in both patients who had high xenophilia, above 300, or low xenophilia, less than 300. And it seems like the exacerbation reduction in the omalizumab patients was more pronounced if there is a history of emergency uh, treatment. Um, higher isinophil hospitalization history means this is a good patient to try umalizumab. Lower lung function is a good patient to try umalizumab. And relative percentage in exacerbation by the blood isinophilia, the higher the peripheral isinophilia in your asthmatics means higher chance umalizumab will have exacerbation risk reduction. Umalizumab has been shown, like other biologics, to reduce the dependence on oral corticosteroids. Actually, the black uh, spot here, 20% and 14%. After two years, the patients who required oral corticosteroids went down from 20, is it 20 or 20 point, sorry, 28.6, went down all the way to 14%. Patients Umalizumab reduced hospitalization. So people who had no hospitalization at the beginning of the study was 62%. People who had no hospitalization after umalizumab went up to 93%. So it reduces the oral systemic corticosteroids need. It reduces your risk, your patient's risk to be hospitalized. It reduces your risk of visiting the emergency treatment. However, I'd like to show you this graph, and this graph applies to umalizumab. However, I see you, I'll tell you that we see this in clinical practice. What the lower graph is showing, this graph is showing the percentage of symptom-free day was significantly greater in umalizumab responder subgroup, 45%, than in the umalizumab treated group, 37%, versus placebo. What am I trying to tell you here? That umalizumab works like magic in some patients. And those are the super responder. And it works in a lot of other patients, but there are placebo that don't respond. And this applies to other biologics. And that's the blessing of having more than one biologic. Sometimes we try one, it does not work. We try the other, it works, and vice versa. So those biologics, even when you think that you gave them for the right patient after you did your stratification, sometimes they don't work. And that's where you try them in umalizumab, for example, we try them for four months. And after that, if they don't really work, we try another biologic. Last part is on nasal polyp. 2013 was the first study that showed umalizumab has an effect on nasal polyp. And they assessed this by two things, nasal congestion score and nasal polyp score. And this study was repeated lately. And again, it showed that the co-primary endpoint, umalizumab, significantly reduced the nasal congestion score, nasal polyp score versus placebo when it was assessed at 24 weeks. And this was statistically significant. And the higher responder rates with umalizumab versus placebo was also obvious in another study that was published 
2020, it says higher proportion venezumab treated group had more than one point uh, and more than two point improvement in nasal polyp score compared to placebo. And the same applies for the nasal congestion score. The funny thing is the response to omalizumab treating nasal polyp, looking at these scores, was found consistently in asthmatics and non-asthmatics. So it seems like it's a disease um, targeting um, agent, regardless of how severe or whether they have asthma or not. And this is my last slide. What we've been trying to say here over the last 24 minutes is that it's important to differentiate uncontrolled asthma versus severe asthma. Severe asthma patients, they have different phenotypes and may respond to different uh, treatments if you choose them well. IgE is central to the allergic inflammation and allergic asthma, which is a prominent asthma phenotype in our uh, practice. Malizumab has been shown consistently to show reduction in exacerbation, asthma exacerbation, hospitalization, reducing the need for oral systemic steroids, has been shown to pre prevent exacerbation, including viral exacerbation, and has been well studied and has a very good safety profile. Thank you very much.